Hey everybody, and welcome to another delightful Dueling Rabbits Productions video, courtesy of me, Amy, and my awesome Swedish drawler. I'm going to try something a little different for my next few videos, and hope you'll join me as we follow a project from start to finish, with demonstrations and discussion of all the steps in between. So please sit back and relax as we journey all the way from initial inspiration to finished object. My draw loom is a 100 cm Glamocra standard with a vertical countermarch and a mirrorhead combination draw loom attachment. The idea for this series came about when I was tidying up the loom room after my summer's exploration of four structures on one warp. I always like to break down the draw loom completely between warps. I disconnect the lambs and treadles, remove all the pattern shafts and extraneous draw loom bits, and disassemble the combo unit as far as possible. It might sound a bit precious, but it's my way of honoring the loom that's worked so hard on my behalf. It also gives me a chance to vacuum the carpet underneath and dust the hard to reach bits. I view the bare boned loom as a blank canvas for my next project. The question is, how do we get from this to this to this? We're about to find out as we delve into the mechanics of planning a warp, setting up the loom with its pattern shafts and single unit draw cords, and weaving our vision to reality. First up is planning a draft and beaming the warp. Inspiration can come from all sorts of places. A textile in a museum, a picture in an old book, or even the burning need to try out a new structure. In this case, the starting point came from a few skeins of fine mora wool, a yarn I'd never woven with before but was eager to try. The wool was in luscious shades of blue and pink, and I thought it would make a great winter scarf. But I didn't really have a plan in mind until I came across this draft on Ravelry. It's an old block profile in the public domain that came to me via Robin Spady's blog. Something about this design really appealed to me. I loved the basket weave frames with the monk's belt flower motifs inside them. I knew I wanted to weave my scarf in six end irregular satin damask. A quick analysis revealed that there were six blocks which for that structure would require six shafts each. On my conventional single harness standard, I would need 36 shafts, but it's totally doable on my draw loom, which would also give me infinite opportunities for modifying the design. Before I could work my magic, I needed to establish the overall parameters for my piece. How wide should it be? How many pattern repeats could I include? I started by isolating one pattern repeat from here to here. Each repeat consisted of two vertical basket weave stripes of 10 columns or units each, and two complete monk's belt flowers of 9 units each. I didn't think 9 units was sufficient for my creative purposes, and I increased that number to 11 for my project. I wanted the edges of my piece to be logical and include only full width flowers. So beyond the repeat, I extended the draft 15 units to the right and 16 units to the left, like that. I now had sufficient data for my calculations. Two complete repeats of the pattern required 84 units. The completion of the right side of the pattern needed 15 more and the completion on the left side required 16 more than that. Add up all those numbers, and you get 115 units. I have to multiply each of those numbers by 6 because I have 6 ends per unit. 504, 90, and 96. Add those together, and I get 690 ends. 115 times 6 is also 690. So, by double checking my math, I knew that I was correct. At 40 ends per inch, 690 ends gives me 17.25 inches in the reed, which is fairly close to my desired width of 18 inches for a good scarf, 
I also reasoned that I was estimating at too close a set, and would likely be re-slaying my reed and weaving a wider piece as a result. This suspicion was borne out later on. My final set was 36 ends per inch, with a width in the reed of about 19 inches. Next came one of my favorite parts of the whole process, and not just because it gave me quality time with Jensen. Got my laptop, opened up Fiberworks, and set to work designing my draft and pattern shaft configuration. Here's the first iteration of my drawdown, showing the original profile adapted for 115 units. In this case, the black squares in the threading box represent the six thread leashes on their pattern shafts. First, I tackled the vertical basket weave stripes, since I knew they would be repeated and unchanged throughout the piece. I threaded these on the four pattern shafts at the front of the loom. This gave me an efficient, if inflexible, setup for weaving these repetitive figures. Next, I had to figure out how to configure the pattern shafts for the rest of the design. I immediately saw that the draw loom would allow me to change up those monk's belt flowers into any design I wanted, given whatever parameters I set myself. Since I consider my loom to be a pattern shaft draw loom primarily, and I enjoy weaving symmetrical motifs, I decided to set those flowers in repeated point formation on six additional pattern shafts. This would allow me to weave the profile as written, and also to change up those motifs into different symmetrical designs as the mood took me. But that still seemed a little too repetitious, and barely scratched the surface of my draw loom's remarkable capabilities. Why not allow myself different motifs in the same row, say two out of the five squares? With all these units on the same pattern shafts, that would not be possible. But if these 22 units were moved to their own shafts, I would have additional blocks to play with for my designs. Fiber works to the rescue. In short order, that job was done, allowing me the freedom to mix motifs in the same row. But I thought it would be fun to add what I call Easter eggs to my design, little unexpected touches that aren't symmetrical and don't repeat. Surprises that you might not notice at first glance. To enable me to weave my Easter eggs, I decided to add single poles to each unit in this second set of repeated points, which I designated with red dots. This gave me a lot of flexibility within the efficient shaft draw setup. While I could still use my pattern shafts exclusively, either to repeat the same symmetrical motifs all the way across the row or to change them up a bit, with my single draw cords I could plan a single whimsical pop-up in just one of the boxes, like this rabbit. I could use the second set of draw cords to echo the symmetrical motif in the rest of the row if I wished. I could use both sets of draw cords for Easter eggs such as this fox and dog, or my initials at the bottom of the piece. The three remaining motifs on their pattern shafts must always be identical, symmetrical designs. By combining this variety of pattern shaft threadings with single unit draw cords, my draw loom enabled me to go from this to this a complex design with lots of interesting things to look at and weave. I had a lot of fun imagining all the different motifs, especially the Easter eggs, which were inspired by all the little critters we most commonly see in our backyard. Now that my design was at least partly resolved, I was almost ready to wind my warp. First, I needed to do a little more math to see how long it could be. One skein of Mora yarn consists of about 950 meters. I had three of them for a grand total of 2,850. 690 ends, four meters each, comes to a total of 2,760 meters. That number's less than what I had, so I figured I was good to go. My three skeins of yarn enabled me to hold three threads in my hand while winding making a 3x3 three three cross quick and efficient work. I like this arrangement for 6 end satin. It helps enormously when threading the heddles and catching mistakes. I was also delighted to discover that, for once, 
my math was correct. On my four-meter warp, I had just enough left over for sampling and for repairing any ends that might break during weaving. I chained off my two bouts and prepared the loom for beaming. At this juncture, I really need to point out that there are as many ways to warp a loom as there are weavers. This is the method I use. I adapted it from the traditional Swedish back-to-front approach I learned way back when, and have seen no need to change it since it works for me. It involves rough slaying a reed at the back of the loom, and transferring the lee sticks to the back beam before winding on. Let's switch to the present tense and get to it. Here is the loom prepared for beaming. We're standing at the back. You can see I've taken two unbelievably long boards and rested them across the top of the beater and the back beam. The reed I will be rough slaying is laid across them. Behind the reed are my lee sticks, which have been threaded through the crosses on my two bouts and secured to the long boards. The bouts have been unchained a bit, although their choke ties are still on, and secured in the beater. The other ends disappear into a box on the floor at the front of the loom. Nothing for it now but to remove the choke ties at the crosses and start rough slaying. I've marked all my reeds at the center point so I can easily measure side to side and confirm I am threading where I need to. Here we are part way along. Given the reed at my disposal, I had to do some tricks with empty dents, but you can see it's coming along nicely. I really like using a reed for spreading my warp rather than a rattle, but I know lots of weavers who use a rattle with great results. I've tried both methods and personally like the process of getting my warp ends just so, and find this part of the process doesn't take nearly as long as one might imagine. When I'm done, I get out my trusty tape measure and make sure the width in the reed is as expected. It is! Hooray! On to the next step. At this point, I need to get my warp loops onto the tie-on bar that I'll attach to the warp beam. I lay that across my support sticks and match up the center mark with the center mark on the reed. To make things simple, I've also marked where the cords for the warp beam will go. Now all I have to do is flip the reed over, then thread the bar through the loops of the warp, pausing only to slip on the attachment cords where the marks show me they are needed. When I'm done, I like to examine all the loops carefully to make sure none is on the wrong side of the lee sticks or missing from the tie-on bar. That all looks pretty good to me. So now it's time to tension the warp. You can see that the bouts travel through the beater, over the breast beam, under the footrest, and over the top of the trapeze. I love my trapeze more than I can say. My son made it for me out of some old 1x3s we had in the basement and a closet rod from the hardware store. It makes beaming a beautifully well-tensioned warp the work of only a few moments. I like a 3-pound workout weight on each bout, regardless of the yarn I'm using. I just adjust the size of the bouts to accommodate. So now that the warp is tensioned, we are ready to remove the supports so we can move the lee sticks to their place behind the reed. I tighten the ratchet on the warp beam and spread the warp out over the tie-on rod to get rid of the worst crosses and overlap. I flip the reed back so it's no longer resting on the lee sticks. I untie the lee sticks and remove the supports from the setup. I couldn't do that and film at the same time since the draw loom is shoehorned into such a small space but you can see the aftermath of the kerfuffle here. The reed is hanging free, supported only by the tensioned warp. The lee sticks are also unsecured and ready for their adventure. Since the rearmost lee stick is in the same configuration at the cross as the tie-on rod, I can remove it with no ill effects. Nonetheless, I usually hold my breath as I do so. Eek! Now I turn the remaining lee stick onto its side and smush it up against the reed. This gives me a duplicate shed into which to slide the first stick. It's now behind the reed where it belongs. 
I check to make sure nothing is untoward and breathe a sigh of relief. Now I can safely remove the second stick. I turn the tie-on rod on its side to make a shed and insert the second stick. Hey presto, the cross has been transferred, so now it's behind the reed. It's pretty cool how it works. Before anything bad can happen, I tie the leaf sticks back together and stand back to admire my handiwork. Next, I move the reed forward to place it in the beater. Apart from the fact that the journey is several miles to the front of the loom, this usually goes without too much of a hitch. A certain amount of finessing is required because the reed is wider than the superstructure of my loom, but with a bit of finagling we get there in the end. I have the center of the beater marked with pencil, so I know exactly where to align the center mark on the reed. It looks so nice already! Now, just some final housekeeping before I start winding on. I make sure all the loops are nicely spaced over the tie-on rod. I ensure the warp is evenly tensioned so that the lee sticks are nice and level. I make sure the lee sticks are slid forward sufficiently so that I can crank one turn of the warp without having to shift them again. Then I start winding away, inserting a warping stick on every flat edge of the beam. When I've done that, I slide the leaf sticks forward again. This helps to isolate any small tension issues towards the front of the loom. I pat the warp for encouragement and check the leaf sticks again to make sure they are still level and parallel to the floor. If not, I would give the weights at the front of the loom an additional yank. I keep winding, sliding, and adding sticks until I have a perfect cylinder around my warp beam and the other ends of the bouts are caught in the reed and have pulled the beater back as far as it can go. I tie the lee sticks to the back beam, cut off the front ends of the warp, and wind the remainder on, tying it in bunches in case the worst were to happen. It can be safely left like this for ages, so let's take a break before moving on. We still have loads to do. In my next few videos, we'll be threading the heddles with an ingenious hybrid strategy, distributing the pattern shafts, installing the single unit draw cords, tying up the treadles, fine-tuning the shed, and weaving. I hope you'll join me.